So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, today we've got uh, the wonderful Tracy with us who um, is going to speak to us about breathing and exercise, sport and exercise. Now Tracy's background is as a, what she still is, a free diver. And for those of you that don't know, that basically means she goes diving, but without the aid of any additional oxygen or breathing support. So you can imagine knowing how you breathe and improving her capacity for breathing and holding her breath is somewhat important. Um, and that's led her down the road to um, explore more about breathing, the importance of how we breathe and the way we breathe. And she's now qualified as a functional breathwork instructor. And on that guise, she works with all kinds of individuals to help improve their breathing. And that includes um, athletes and those that are either uh, into their elite sport, maybe training for a big event, or just generally into their exercise and want to get the most from it. So before we talk about the specifics of breathing and exercise, can you just explain a bit more to us, Tracy, about what a, a functional breathwork instructor is? Sure. Thank you, Lorna. So functional breathwork focuses on two elements. One is blood chemistry, so how oxygen and carbon dioxide interact in the blood. And secondly, it's the biomechanics of the body. So how the respiratory muscles move and the interconnectedness of this within the body. So between the brain, the nerves, nervous system, organs, muscle, tissue, fascia, everything. Um, and understanding how to breathe to live an optimal lifestyle. Fantastic. So yeah, I mean, obviously, Breathing is important. A lot of people, unfortunately, they, these days do tend to sort of breathe through their, their mouths. And we often think, especially with sport, well, I'm going to end up breathing with through my mouth um, just because of the sheer uh, exertion of the, the activity that I'm doing. But from your perspective, what does sort of dysfunctional or poor breathing look like when it comes to sport and exercise? Well, mouth breathing is really quite key here because. If you've been a mouth breather all your life, you've never used your nose in the way it should be used, it has a major knock-on effect on inflammation within the chest. So a good example of this would be exercise-induced asthma, mm -hmm. where you breathe in a large quantity of unfiltered air through your mouth into the lungs, and that causes moisture to pull away from the airways, causing them to constrict that then causes inflammation and gives you that sense of wheezing and coughing. And really and truly, that is something that can be completely eliminated by relearning how to breathe correctly from the nose. Wow, that's a, I mean, that's a huge thing, full stop right there. And I say just from personally point of view, I know I've, I have in the past been diagnosed with exercise induced asthma and no, uh, one of my biggest frustrations when I exercise is that certainly if I try and go for runs or if there's any big inclines, um, I often joke that I've got um, the lungs of an asthmatic gerbil because I just hit a point and it just feels like there's tightness around my chest mm -hmm. and I recover very, very quickly. But as soon as I hit that, that either period of running again or that amount of incline again, um, it's that tightness that, that comes through. And you're saying that that can be changed by just changing how I how I breathe and, and improving my, my nose breathing. Absolutely. Um, by employing nasal breathing when you're running, essentially what you're doing is you're slowing down the speed of your breath mm -hmm. and you're reducing the breathing volume and that causes an increase in carbon dioxide in the blood. And this causes an increase of oxygenation. So when we have an increase of CO2, Mm -hmm. that impacts on the hemoglobin proteins releasing more oxygen into the blood and when you have more oxygen you use less energy on your breathing muscles to achieve the same result so for endurance athletes you know individuals doing long distance running cycling open water swimming all and I've worked with individuals in all of these um, disciplines the relearning to breathe correctly out of the water for swimmers particularly this improves performance in the endurance because you are breathing more economically 
And the advice is for, you know, the vast majority of my clients would be a recreational athletes. You know, they, they do it for the pleasure, but they are serious about it. So if they've, they've got a, a time they want to beat or a PB, you know, that this is, you know, those few minutes or seconds do make a difference. And generally speaking, when I work with them, if they employ nasal breathing during exercise, over six to eight week period, we see an increase in breathing efficiencies because the body starts to adapt, you know, and we're working with muscles. So just like you can train, a, you know, a leg muscle or an arm muscle or a stomach muscle, you can also train your diaphragm, which is your main breathing muscle. Mm. And as you know, it's all interconnected, you know, so it's the nasal breathing, learning to breathe from the diaphragm and under duress so when you are running and breathing through your nose it's not going to feel comfortable in the first instance so we get them to train in short spurts and you'll also find because the nose is sensitive it tends to stream so tissues you know don't go running without something to, to blow your nose because it gen genuinely will stream um, but the long-term benefit is that it improves recovery and it takes pressure away from the cardiac muscles. So the heart doesn't have to work so hard in order to perform under, under uh, for an endurance sport. It's interesting, like you say, I think it's easy to forget that the diaphragm is a muscle. Mm -hmm. And like you say the muscles around the ribs that, that work when we, when we breathe, if we've been mouth breathing and not using those muscles properly, then it's going to take a bit of time to, to kind of retrain, but six to eight weeks to start seeing a difference really isn't that that long, is it? And then is this just practicing things while you're doing the sport, or are they, can you sort of do things away from the sport that will help to improve on that as well? Well, part of what I, te I teach my clients is, you know, you it, it's all good and well to do nasal breathing when you're exercising, but you should be doing it 24-7. So it's getting into a new habit, which can be challenging because habits don't just happen overnight. We have to almost put little micro habits in place. So it starts with self-awareness. You know, you could be walking to the shop or taking the dog out or making a cup of tea, for example. But if you realize your mouth breathing, being self-aware, switching back to nasal, that's really important. That's the key in the very beginning is for getting the body to relearn to breathe properly through the nose. The exercises can be implemented a few minutes a day, learning to breathe light, slow, and deep. And that's the exercises that I teach my clients is really focusing on lateral expansion of the diaphragm and keeping the mouth closed at all times. This also impacts at night when you sleep, you wanna be sleeping with your mouth closed. And I know we have another video that we've done on sleep and techniques to improve sleep quality. So mouth taping can be hugely beneficial if you are a snorer or you suffer with sleep apnea. And that combination of self-awareness, practical exercises, creating these new habits, possibly mouth taping if you have to, when you exercise and you continue to practice the nasal breathing, it's a much more holistic approach and the body is functioning much more economically and optimally 24 seven during the day while sleeping and during exercise. And it pays off when you are doing your run, your cycle, your swim, your, your mountaineering, all of that, the benefit is then felt when you are actually under stress because the, the diaphragm has been retrained to perform correctly. And like you say, if you're then nasal breathing and improving the efficiency of your oxygen uptake, these muscles aren't having to work as hard to, to get you the oxygen you need to continue to do the exercise that you're trying to do. So you've got that capacity to, for the muscles to receive all the oxygen that they, they need, the working muscles as well. And I guess there's a, if you notice the spin off then with the recovery, Absolutely. Exercise. Recovery times um, decrease. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about recovery, if you're doing a, a series of exercises in a short space of time, this could be, you know, exercising at pace for 15 minutes, 
and then have recovery time and tracking how, how long it takes for the heart rate to come down. And, you know, with the, a lot of athletes like to use chest straps and apps these days, wearable technology to measure their heart rate as well as their heart rate variability, which is very interesting to, to note. But I think for general purposes, what it's really important to remember is that our lung volume decreases as we get older. And research has shown that lung volume doesn't respond to physical training. So when we do any form of high intensity exercise, we're placing extra demand on our breathing muscles and our diaphragms tend to get fatigued. That's just what happens. And when fatigue sets in, blood is then diverted from the legs to support your breathing muscles, which is why you end up with metabolic byproducts like lactic acid accumulating in the legs, causing cramp and discomfort. So by changing the breathing habits, day-to-day -day sleep and exercise, you actually reduce the effort of taking an inhale. And the blood flow can potentially increase then to your legs by 7%. So imagine if you're a triathlete, you know, your legs are your you know, as your winning limbs, you need them to work properly. So being able to increase oxygen and blood flow to the legs is, is crucial, you know, if you are, if you're trying to break a PB, for example, and it is a very much a, um, it's a full body training program. So we're not just training the diaphragm, we're looking at all the breathing muscles, as well as, you know, the mental state, because the mind is just, you know, you can be physically um, able to do something, but if the mind is not in sync with the body, the performance doesn't happen. That's uh, interesting, actually, because we, like you say, we, this is part of a series of, vid of videos talking about different elements of health and well-being and lifestyle that that breathing has an impact in. And we mentioned a little bit in the, in the one with sleep about how actually, yes, there's the physical benefit for exercise and performance and just generally being outdoors and active of breathing through your nose and correcting your breathing habit but also how breath work can help in terms of emotional elements anxiety and stress and, and calming that down as well isn't there certainly um, and i i know we have another video coming up on stress and anxiety particularly mm. um, but it is it all goes hand in hand yeah and Good. yeah so, so yeah, it's sort of one feeds in into the other. So if you're someone who's thinking, okay, brilliant, you know, it's not just training the muscles I need to use to do the exercise, but how can I get the benefit of breathing properly? If you're someone that perhaps gets performance anxiety before a, a competition maybe, um, or uh, just a general high stress work life, and you're aware that you know, you use exercise as a way of downtime, but how, how else can breathing, you get the benefits in both worlds, the benefits of breath work for your exercise and the benefits of breath work for, for helping calm that, that stress level down as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely check out, check out the other videos. And are there any other general sort of tips that you want to pass on in terms of how to incorporate um, breath work for, for those looking for it for exercise and sport? I think it's worth mentioning, you know, with the, the exercises that we use for, for sport is slightly different to the ones we would use for stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. You would still incorporate those into a training program because you want to be able to have for the, for the individual to have downtime in terms of their nervous system. And you always want to, if you've been working at pace and pushing the breathing to balance that with slowing the breath down. But for the clients I work with, we do something specifically called intermittent hypercapnic hypoxic training. Was this it? As you <laughs> said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, much, it's a more advanced breathing uh, technique program where we increase carbon dioxide through breath hold and reduce oxygen and breath hold has been proven in sports like running, cycling, and swimming, and most team sports, so rugby, football, hockey, they will all benefit by incorporating breath hold training to improve phys physical efficiency. 
And this is where the overlap with my free diving comes in because we do a lot of CO2 tolerance training to enable us to get more comfortable with diaphragmatic contractions when the body wants to breathe. And you cause adaptation in the breathing muscles when you incorporate breath hold with movement. So it could be breath hold walking, breath hold sprinting, breath hold yoga type practice as well. And these adaptations are what creates a stronger breathing respiratory system within the athlete so that when they are pushing themselves, their breathing actually performs optimally and that that provides the endurance that gets the heart rate lower so that they are still performing at pace. Perhaps they're still hitting their same time, but the body is not under so much duress because the heart is not having to take over from the diaphragm. It, the diaphragm is working correctly. And yeah, I'm very happy to talk about this more if anyone is interested. Yeah, fantastic. So, I mean, like I was just about to say, if this has piqued anyone's uh, interest, where do they, where's the next step for them? What, where can they go to find out, find out more about, about this work? They're welcome to contact me directly. Um, I know you have my contact link in the notes. Yes. Set up a Zoom call or a phone call. We can talk about what you're looking to achieve. I'm also very active on Instagram and LinkedIn under my name, which is Tracy May House. So you can reach out to me on social and yeah, be happy to chat. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for taking the time out to, to talk us through that. I think that's been really interesting to say not just on the exercise, but the the rest of the, the benefits that you get throughout the rest of life and how to incorporate it as well. And we'll definitely have the links available so people can easily find out how to um, go on for further reading, how to reach out to you to, to ask you any further questions or get involved in any of your, your workshops that you're running. So thank you very much for that, Tracy. That's been brilliant. My pleasure. Thank you, Lorna. Cheers.